So yesterday we had talked about literature, art, social science, and politics. That's what the bell ringer was about, which we answered in Canvas chat. Hopefully we're able to look at all the images. And you just need to click on start assignment in the text box, type two facts and one interpretation for each of the images. So if you didn't submit that already, you'll have time after the notes. So Western imperialism. Particularly India and Africa. The colonial era involved North America and Latin America. The imperial era would mostly involve India and Africa. And you started to see some inclusiveness. The British portrayal, for instance, of the empire being made up of all these different people, for, for instance, so at least placated people and made them think that there was diversity for being important. But that wasn't necessarily always true. So at first, when the colonial era was involved, the European countries fought with each other quite a bit. That's what the Seven Years War slash French and Indian War was about. Even the American War for Independence was about that. Uh, but, uh, of course, there's a few, few countries that left. The scramble for territory, Spain and Portugal fell behind, and Britain became the more dominant country. And imperialism this time is going to be built quite a bit around free trade and the influence of industrialization. And there's also going to be new settler colonies, like the ones that we had here in the States, in... Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And of course, they're shifting away from the Atlantic to Asia and Africa in particular. Uh, the British would focus a lot on India, which of course has a very heterogeneous or similar population, but they have a lot of complex social and economic conditions, including the fact that there are both Hindus and Muslims living in India, the fact that they had a caste system which relegated people to the same jobs and status as their parents and their parents before them. And the British kind of led the way through economics, particularly through the East India Company. But there would be resistance. For instance, in 1857, the Sepoy Rebellion, which actually started because the Indian troops that served the British Army heard rumors that uh, grease that was made for machinery and weapons was made from cows, which, of course, for the Hindu people was deeply upsetting. Of course, that rumor was untrue, but it did cause a revolt. And the British ended up eventually sweeping in from the coasts, controlling more and more territory in India, in 1820, they already controlled quite a bit, but then they maximized territory in the north and east. And by 1856, controlled a considerable portion of India and the modern-day surrounding countries, for instance, like Bangladesh. And there's a picture of the Sepoy Rebellion. And the amusing part about that, of course, is, is that there were people of Indian descent that also served amongst the British. So this new imperialism that would exist from 1870 to 1914 was more about direct control by Westerners. So the colonial independence that we were allowed to have going back to the founding of the colonies didn't really exist in these new places. And it would be for a brief period of time. If you think about it, 1870 to 1914, you're like, well, that's actually over 40 years. But remember that our colonization started in the early 1600s and lasted until 1776 or so. So this was a much shorter period of time. And it involved some other actors, for instance, like the United States. Since we were interested in grabbing up some parts of Latin America, 
and Asia. We had our brief war with the Spanish, for instance, gaining control of the Philippines and a few other places like Puerto Rico. And the motives for imperialism will mostly involve economics. Now, there'll be some justification of why it was necessary, but it really will just be about economics. But people will make excuses saying it's about social Darwinism, it's about the superior and the weak, and showing a better way of life and civilization, so a type of paternalistic racism. And there would be some religious groups that would advocate for the spread of Christianity, even though religious attendance is still pretty high in Europe, it's not what it used to be. And there are a lot of skeptics and doubters of the church, as we mentioned yesterday. So there was hopes for various churches and finding new converts in other part of the world. And, of course, there are some conspiracy theorists that said, well, we still have lots of problems in Europe. They're just engaging in this imperialism to forget about the problems that we have at home. But many people would believe, of course, that they were trying to make the world better. In both France and Britain, you would find this point of view. And let's also talk about Africa a little bit. Of also during this period of time, Africa was seen as a robust area for natural resource development. Things like ivory, rubber, minerals, diamonds, and gold could all be found there. And this time, they didn't actually end up fighting like they did in North America. They had what was called the Berlin Conference, where they mapped out each part of Africa that the Europeans would get to control. Of course, it didn't include any Africans in this discussion, and it ended up creating very artificial borders that would cross language and ethnic lines in Africa that would end up throwing different groups of people together simply so Europeans could get their hands on resources. Uh, before the Berlin Conference, though, as it is displayed up here in the map, there was really little European involvement in the African continent. Most of it just occurred along the coasts including Egypt, controlled by the British, along with their Cape Colony, which they often conflicted with the Dutch, Algeria, which is controlled by the French, and then, of course, uh, the Ottoman Empire had just as much influence as the rest of Europe. But over time, eventually the entire continent was carved up, as it's displayed in the second map. The British territory is going to run through the spine of Africa, especially using things like the Nile River, to places that they would have considerable amounts of resources. The French controlled quite a volume of territory as indicated by the pink shaded color. Uh, they caught the Sahara, ooh. <laughs> but they did get quite a bit of land. And then probably the most notorious out of the European powers would be Belgium, surprisingly. Belgium was considered a more neutral country, so they were put in the center of Africa, kind of a crossroads. Uh, but the Belgian king in particular, who legally considered this his personal property, not necessarily the property of the Belgian people, uh, would use quite brutal tactics in harvesting rubber sap, which would be the original uh, ingredient used to make rubber today. We use synthetics, obviously. And quite a bit of harsh manual labor was used in order to achieve that. North Africa was technically part of the Ottoman Empire. Egypt, of course, was originally part of the British system. Their use of Egypt usually involved cotton, but then eventually development of the Suez Canal in order to get ships between the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean Sea. Egypt did have its own government, but of course, through all these projects, it became bankrupt, and the British used their opportunities to seize control. 
But nevertheless, the opening of the Suez Canal was considered a big boost for Egypt in particular, although they personally would not control it. That would be a major issue of contention in the 20th century, particularly during the Cold War. Then West Africa, as I said before, the France controlled much of the sub-Saharan Africa, while the British controlled along that spine of Africa that I pointed out earlier. Although they did control a few along the coast on the western side of the continent. And then the Congo. The Congo was controlled by King Leopold of Belgium. He supposedly made himself out to be a humanitarian ruler, uh, but in fact, over time during his rule, about one half of the population of Congo were either murdered, exploited through starvation and disease. Ivory, of course, would also be one of the resources which ended up devastating the animal population. And throughout time, eventually, there would be European criticism of King Leopold as illustrated by the political cartoon indicating his overuse of manual labor when it came to harvesting rubber, supposedly choking the African people. And the legacy in Africa continues till today. The countries that you see on a map were not designed by Africans. They were designed by Europeans for the most part including many groups of people that don't necessarily get along, including some artificially made tribes the Europeans created in order to facilitate tension between different groups of people, so that way they would be too busy hating each other instead of fighting the Europeans. So tomorrow we'll talk about Germany, Russia, South Africa, and Asia. Germany and Russia will have a lesser impact, but they'll still be involved. South Africa is an interesting point because it is influenced by both the British and the Dutch in a system that would create one of the most racist regimes, even greater than that of the Confederacy in the South. And we'll look a little bit more at other parts of Asia besides India. So for the rest of the period, finish up that images assignment if you haven't already done so, or the reading from earlier in the week to finish up the period.